We'd like to uh, welcome everyone to the 2022 Sutherland Institute Congressional Series. I'm Rick Larson, CEO of Sutherland, and we're pleased to host this event on an annual basis. Uh, it, it's an opportunity, we believe, for you to hear directly from your elected officials to hear on a topic that they consider important and to hear from them without interruption. We're joining uh, those online. We're, we're again in the uh, in this beautiful space at Zions Bank. We thank them for sponsoring this event. And we're also uh, pleased to convene a small live audience today as we work our way back from, from uh, restrictions. Today, we're welcoming Congressman Blake Moore. He represents Utah's first district and has done so since 2021. Uh, we recognize Congressman that uh, August is a very busy month for you. I know I've personally attended a couple of other events you've been involved with in the, just the past few days. So thank you for participating. Today's topic chosen by the Congressman is our nation's debt and deficit crisis, topic that takes on perhaps some new significance given events of the last 48 hours. Um, yeah, yeah, a cheerful event, <laughs> a, cheer, a cheerful event. Um, so we're, we're pleased to be here and, and sharing this with you. Um, after his remarks, we'll do the customary Q&A today that will be hosted by uh, Sutherland Vice President of Strategy and Communications, Nick Dunn. So we will uh, turn the time over to Representative Moore, uh, allow him to speak as long as he's inclined, and then we'll move the podium and, and go into a question and answer period. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the chance to chat with everyone today. I would love to get to the Q&A portion as quickly as possible, but I do have some prepared remarks. and. As I joked a minute ago, like <laughs> such a downer, right? Debt and deficit. Can't you, as a politician, come up with something else more fun to talk about? And I refuse to. I don't know what it is. Uh, it's probably the the biggest risk that any politician in today's political environment will get involved with is because you're set up for failure. Uh, with so much of the way things have gone over the last 20, 22 years, I'll I'll hit on that a little more specifically. But it's not a topic that you know, many uh, are trying to talk about. And I'll give you an example. One of my biggest frustrations in 2016 through the presidential debate process was nobody, only one, only one Republican on a stage of like, I think there was like 72 candidates at that time. Um, only one was even talking about it. And then by the time it gets to the general, it's not even a debate topic anymore. That was the moment that I noticed that people really don't want to talk about this anymore. It's just becoming a real frustration for Americans, but it's getting swept under the rug to some degree by, by politicians. And as you've seen over the course of 20 years, since the last time we had a budget surplus, uh, we have not been able to, to, to get back to that point. And so it's one of those things that's like, okay, if a Republican is in, in, in the White House, we haven't gotten back to you know, a balanced budget. When a Democrat is in the White House, we haven't got back to balanced budget. And that continues on and on and on. And if other people are like me, and I think a lot of people are, there's a real frustration. I know that Utahns find it very, very frustrating because we see the success that comes from smart economic policy and, you know, making sure that we're fiscally responsible. So I've got several talking points that I wanted to just get through today, but that's kind of why ultimately I wanted to, to share that. And I'm going to ask a couple of my team members to pass out a little QR code. So feel free to grab your phone out, scan the QR code, and that's going to give you about an eight-page document. Again, another, another boring thing that I'm presenting to you all today is an eight-page document on, on debt and deficit. But it's something I'm extremely passionate about, and that's what I uh, would love for you. And you don't have to read it right now, but at some point, you've got it up on your phone. Take a look at it. I encourage folks to to kind of see what my vision is on how this on how this plays out. Um, I just want to quickly mention and appreciate my team. We have a whole group of my team here today. So just quickly raise your hand. Uh, we've got casework. We've got district director. A couple of interns. Like I mentioned, our casework. Our our you know the State Department has um, had a tough time processing passports. It's the only thing I've known. But so the last 18 months seems like I can't imagine this is how it's really gone. 
but I want Hannah, who's here to know that I personally went through the passport process. I planned it out. I, I, I did it in plenty of time. It took way long, but I didn't even have to call my congressman to uh, advance this, this, uh, this nonsense of getting a passport. But our team is available, and we love doing the work that oftentimes gets overlooked. And it's some of the most important work that we do with respect to helping individuals through any uh, federal agency, Social Security, IRS, uh, passports, things like that. Just always remember, anytime that I get a chance to share how great my team is and what they're doing, um, really, really appreciate it from the district, the district office. A majority of my actual work time is probably spent in Washington. If you look at the congressional calendar, it's spent in Washington. So obviously the legislative work, and that's where most of the news comes from with respect to a congressional team. But the work that our team in, in our Ogden office throughout northern Utah does is truly exceptional, and I very much appreciate it. Um, so let me jump into the three main topics, and then there's a lot of news of the day that I hope that we can cover in, in a bit of our Q&A. But the three things that I wanted to kind of highlight today is, you know, is you know, laying the groundwork and understanding what our issues are with respect to debt and deficit. And that's, try, that's what I'm trying to do with these recommendations. It's what I've been building up towards. Emphasize the importance of winning elections and you know, what comes from not doing that. And then um, highlighting, you know, juxtaposing 2017 versus 2021. Because never, never in my recent history can I remember a time where you can compare economic policy so closely with respect to the um, political environment in Washington, D.C.? And by that, I simply mean the, when you have the White House, the House, and the Senate in one party kind of control, this happened very quickly, right? It was 2017 and 20. So 2016 to 2017, you had Republicans in the in control of the White House, House, and Senate. And then in 2020 to today, you have Democrats in control of the White House, House, and Senate. And there is two simple things to look at with respect to that. That's kind of what I wanted to share today. So real quick on debt and deficit. I, I pulled up just actually some quick numbers before I was going to address this. It's not part of some of the research that I did for this, but I, I actually, you know, because I love talking debt to GDP ratio, and, and that's where we need to zero all of our focus on is debt to GDP ratio. That is the fundamental, most important um, metric that we can use when we identify the health of, uh, of our, uh, our fiscal health as a nation. And right now, our debt to GDP ratio is well past anywhere it's been. Um, to well, it's, it's, we, we've gone beyond where it was for World War II hooks without a World War II type of um, catastrophic event. We haven't, we, haven't, we haven't experienced a World War II in the last few years, but where debt to GDP ratio has grown beyond that level. Um, we overspent tremendously with respect to COVID response, and that's caused some very negative outcomes, and it's directly related to our debt to GDP. So uh, pulling about Pulling down that debt to GDP ratio, that's fundamental. What, what, what's, what's, what's in this document that I've provided for you is, is getting that to the level of a healthy sustainment. And that's more, that's closer to a 0 0.7, 0 0.8 than the 1.3 that we're, that we're um, hovering at right now. So pulling that back down, and we should naturally do some of that with COVID spending um, being reduced. So some of it will naturally happen, but we have got to work harder to get to that point. But the key part that I wanted to highlight today was something that I never understood before getting into the arena and getting heavily involved in the budgeting process, and that's what's called mandatory spending. Uh, many of you are probably like, yeah, we already know about this. Da, 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 da. You're probably preaching to the choir to many of you, but I just want to overemphasize <clears throat> how important the concept of mandatory spending is to getting ourselves in a much better, stronger future with respect to our fiscal health. Um, I serve on Armed Services Committee and Natural Resources Committee, but was just also appointed to a third committee in my freshman year, my freshman term, to the Budget Committee as well. Something that has been a really strong passion of mine. When I decided to run for, for Congress, 
debt was one of those topics that I continued. I wanted to, to, to talk about. It's kind of what I saw as a frustration of mine, but I wanted to make sure that I didn't, I did my part to communicate that. And, um, and I did from the, from getting into the, getting into my very first campaign back in January of 2020, I made debt one of the three key things that I was talking about. And, uh, at that time, it was, hey, we've had really strong economic growth. We need to continue this. Our economy's operating at all four cylinders. Again, this was pre-COVID. We need to take advantage of this economic growth period to really get some of our spending under control. And, and folks, as I've learned and been in numerous conversations with individuals like Kevin Brady, who's the ranking member of Ways and Means, uh, you know, Paul Ryan as well, who was the previous chairman of Ways and Means, um, that the, the, the whole plan was Tax Cut and Jobs Act and as quickly as possible, and some even wanted to do it at that same time, but Tax Cut and Jobs Act, along with entitlement reform, spending measures and spending cuts to be able to, 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 to truly take advantage of, of you know, the strong economic output we would get from Tax Cut and Jobs Act, but get our spending also under control. And we were able to do the first part, but not necessarily the second part. And, um, and that is on the horizon. And it's something that I'm very passionate about, something that I want to tackle. But again, so starting my campaign, economic growth, we hit COVID. So we went through a whole bunch of spending. And you can dissect that 17 different ways. Uh, I, I've got it pretty simplified into, into, into one really, really bad bill called the American Rescue Plan that created 9.1% inflation. It can, continues to bog us down from over 15 or 16 or so months ago. But we, we have to, in the next interim period, in the next several years, let me call it five years, we've got to figure out a way to put trust and faith back in the American people that we can get our spending under control. Because regardless of, of what types of revenue increases we make, especially just tax increases, which is what we'll see from this current reconciliation bill that's going to be that will be passed on Friday from House Democrats. Um, what we will see is more taxes going to a black hole of government spending. And unless we were able to sort of stop that hemorrhaging, that type of tax revenue doesn't really do anything. It just continues to go into more and more, more and more, more and more government spending. And, um, and that's the key to be able to fix. So let me highlight two quick things. Um, the piece that the piece of information that I pulled up right before this was how many times have we actually had a balanced budget in our nation's history? And going back to like 1920s when I looked at it, folks, it's it's, it's not that many times. There's there's five or six actual times that we've had a budget surplus at the federal level. And as Utahns, that's frustrating. Uh, State governments operate different than federal governments. We don't print money. Federal governments can print money. You can go the rounds on this. But what you can't, what you cannot pass by or simply overlook is that in the course of 100 years, we have always gotten back to having a balanced budget. About the way I looked at it, about every 10 to 15 years, we would somehow get back into a budget surplus. And what I look at is that is something that gives confidence and faith to the American taxpayer is that, yeah, there'll be a time and there'll be a war and there'll be an infrastructure need and there'll be something that takes place in our history where we at the federal government um, you know, run a deficit for several years string. But historically looking back, we've always gotten ourselves back to a balanced budget. And we're now at 22 years where we haven't even come close. Well, we did, we did come close towards a couple of periods in that. Um, but we are, we are so far away from that right now. Our, our, our deficit spending is so far out of whack right now that the American people are, are, are just so frustrated with Washington and, the, and, and our inability to be able to do that. Um, and uh, what, 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 what I firmly have a better understanding now than what I did prior to my time in, in Washington, in the arena, as I would say, was that there's a fundamental shift in mandatory spending. 
Okay, mandatory spending is those measures in the budget that we as congressmen and women, we don't even touch each year. And that is the most concerning part is some of these things get put on autopilot and we don't even have the ability to say, all right, let's, we got a problem. Let's work together and figure out how we're going to get this solved. Even if it's, you know, in a, in a, in a split government, or if it's in a one party ruled government, because there's different elements that they, they go into play there. We don't even have the ability to really vote on it each year. I haven't voted on anything like there's, there's Medicare provisions and things like that that I vote on, but we don't really vote on much of that. There's not much, there's not a social security bill that I'm out there voting on all the time. These things are placed on autopilot and they need to go through some substantive reform. And without that reform, what we've seen happen over the 50, last 50 years will continue to happen and it will make it harder and harder to address the needs of our country going forward like things within a defense bill or like things within um, you know, many of the other aspects of our discretionary budget. So our mandatory budget in 1971 covered about 30% of our budget. These are the things, again, healthcare, Social Security, all of that aspect that, 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 that is what you would consider sort of our entitlement side of the, of the ledger. Then you had discretionary spending, which covered about 70% of the budget. Well, over the last 50 years, those two things have swapped. And right now, officially, it's about 65% of our budget is mandatory spending. And less than 30% is discretionary. And we have some debt. Uh, we, we have debt payments that cover an additional um, 5 or 6%. Generally, don't quote me on these exact numbers, but that's generally where it is. So over the last 50 years, you've seen a complete shift into what the entirety of the budget is and what percentage that is. So when Congress votes on a discretionary budget, a, a, an omnibus bill or de a defense bill, that's where all the focus gets because why? Because that's all you have to be critical of Washington. That's all taxpayers have to look at and say, I am critical of them spending this much money on discretionary budget. But that portion of the budget is getting shrunk by so much that it's almost to the point where it's inconsequential. Our mandatory spending grows at a rate much rap much more rapidly than discretionary. In fact, when Republicans were in control of the of Congress from 2010 to 2018, that didn't even grow. Maybe per maybe maybe, maybe it grew for inflation, whatever. That did that that side that side of the budget did not grow. We were able to control that because you vote on it each year. You have control over it. You're held accountable to that. But the behemoth of mandatory spending that continues to grow at an exponential rate, upwards to 12% increased each year, is growing wildly out of control. And we, unless we do some significant reform, you can't stop it. And I don't have all the solutions to how you actually address this. We talk about it in my, in my uh, debt and deficit recommendations. So again, I ask you to, to take a look at that. But I'm just laying out why the issue is what it is and where we need to focus to be able to get ourselves into a much fit, much better fiscal responsibility. Someone who represents Hill Air Force Base, I find it very, very concerning that as mandatory continues to eclipse our entire budget, we are going to have less capability to address the immediate needs. So what have we done for the last 20 years? Well, we still continue to address those needs, but oftentimes we just run budgets. I mean, we just run deficits. And that has, that has ebbed and flowed over the last 20 years, but we have not gotten ourselves back to a balanced budget. And um, I'm, not in one, I'm not here to say that if we were to get the majority, you'll have a balanced budget every year for the next 50 years. That has never happened in the history of our country. I'm just speaking from a historical perspective. I want to be a voice to be able to get to the point of, well, in order for us to restore faith, in our American taxpayer, but also faith in the uh, in the U.S. dollar to remain the reserve status for the world, and many other, you know, significant factors, national security, things like that. Like we have to show the American budget, the American taxpayer, that we can get ourselves back to um, some fiscal sanity, and we haven't been able to do that. Um, that's a big that's a big reason why I am uh, highly motivated to be on the Ways and Means Committee. It's the only committee in Congress that's actually mentioned in the Constitution. Uh, I, I've been closely involved with a lot of the work they're doing. I did this debt and deficit task force 
this was a group of 12 or so individuals, mostly from the first district, but some really smart um, individuals from multiple different types of industries that um, came, came together, share a similar concern that I do, and they wanted to actually do something. Like they were so motivated to do something. We wanted to get something on paper and we did that. Now my job is to share it with, with both constituents and colleagues. And it's been something that I've taken to pretty much every single one of the members of Ways and Means. And um, in my conference, I've shared it with Democrats to say, look, this is my vision. This is something that I, I, I want to be a part of. I view it as our nation's biggest problem and our biggest issue going forward. Leader, uh, Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy continually, constantly, always says, and he'll say it in any setting, that our nation's two biggest issues going forward is debt and China. And I wholeheartedly agree with him on, on those two aspects. So um, please, again, there's, there's things we can do. There is ways to address this. And it's going to take some real reform efforts. But, but the most important thing in government is to hold your elected leaders accountable. And no one's really accountable for our mandatory spending. It's our biggest issue with respect to what we're we're trying to do on the budget and and it's not something that you know anybody's been criticized i got criticized for voting for our military bill i mean imagine being the representative from you know hill air force base and being criticized for voting for a military spending bill um of, of which that we poured our heart and soul into that and and got it to an awesome place and for two years in a row um and but again it's just because challengers don't have anything to go on on our real problem of debt they just pick up whatever spending bill that gets done in washington and they're going to take it and criticize you for it and uh i get it that's part of what being in the arena again but um but we are not even able to necessarily hold our our, our elected leaders accountable because of this strange budgetary issue that is pretty wonky and i definitely didn't understand prior to going into it. I knew the terms mandatory versus discretionary, but I didn't really grasp how important that concept is. And the other thing that's going on right now is a lot of bills are getting, in order for them to get support from Democrat leadership, they're getting placed into mandatory spending. The most recent veterans healthcare bill, of which, let me say, there was a bill that the Senate unanimously supported and there was a bill that I co-sponsored that was blatantly disregarded by Speaker Pelosi because they wanted to go an enormity of a spending bill on the veterans health care one with toxic burn pits. Everybody cares about this issue. But adding a half a trillion dollars to mandatory spending, that's not the approach that we, we need to be able to take. And it's a very tough political situation because it's dealing with veterans health care. No Republican wants to vote against that, but no Republican wants to vote for half a trillion dollars into mandatory spending. So it's just this incredibly difficult situation. A chips bill, a good good chunk of that bill, a, a, the majority of that bill got also put into mandatory spending. So if it's all spending, what does it matter? Well, if you add a bunch to mandatory spending, that doesn't take away from what you're able to, to, to do for discretionary spending if we're going to allow for these deficits to continue to go on and on each year. So yeah, we'll add it to mandatory spending because then that still gives us the freedom to do what we need to do on discretionary. And who loses? Well, my kids do. Because it is um, it is the thing that will cripple us as a nation going forward. And uh, that's why as I've gotten back there, I've had several initiatives. I've worked my tail off on committee. And as hard as I've worked, my team's worked 10 times harder. We've gotten a lot of really good things done. We've had very successful freshman term with regards to legislation. We had Mapland Act passed. We had um, the uh, Medal of Honor Monument Act passed. We had Better Cyber Crimes Metrics passed. We also had Afghanistan Accountability. We just got our Great Salt Lake bill through the House, hoping that something on the Senate can take place. Um, and we've 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 hit above our weight as far as a freshman in the minority. I can say that, and I can I can be very um, proud of the fact that we've been able to do a lot. But as I've zeroed in on the real issues, this has become that real issue. So uh, I know it's a little bit of a boring topic, and there's plenty of other fun things to talk about today. Hopefully, we can get to that in the discretionary spending. I just want to hit on two other things. Uh, when President Biden took over, he, there, he probably expected 
to um, govern over a split government. The Senate was likely going to be 52-48 in favor of Republicans and Mitch McConnell being the, um, the, uh, the majority leader. And Speaker Pelosi was going to hang on to the, um, even though a few of the races trickled in late, Speaker Pelosi was going to hang on to control of the House by just a very narrow four to five vote margin. We can't lose the Georgia Senate like we lost the Georgia Senate. We lost the Georgia Senate. We should not have lost the Georgia Senate. With everything going on from November to January 5th, I look at January 5th as one of the worst days ever because that flipped control of Congress to one party. And and this is key to my 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 whole point of our uh, of of when you juxtapose two simple looks at economic policy, is that enabled losing that Georgia Senate? And, and, and again, let me be very clear. David Perdue won the election on November 3rd, 2020, with 49.7% of the vote. He had to get to 50%, otherwise it was going to be a runoff. And in order to get to 50%, um, he just needed to pick up 0.3 percentage in two months. But a whole bunch of Republicans stayed home, and they didn't vote because they were disenfranchised with everything that was going on, all the rhetoric. And we just can't do that. We have to – we have to – go out and win elections like Glenn Youngkin did in Virginia. I look at that as a really, really sound model. And if you want to you know, look back to, to how great he ran his election, I think that's such a, it's a great way. We've got to be positive, forward-thinking, pro-growth, aspirational on everything that we're doing. Um, but losing that Georgia Senate basically gave Democrats an opportunity for budget reconciliation. A term I did not understand necessarily. As closely as I followed and was aware of the 2017 Tax Cut and Jobs Act, I didn't recognize how much power you can yield with budget reconciliation. Everything the Democrats have tried to do in, in, uh, over the last 18 months has basically come down to their ability to do re budget reconciliation. Um, the $3.5 trillion bill last year was, was going to be done under budget reconciliation. Thankfully, that one um, was that that died. But everything this week is also done by budget reconciliation, meaning they don't have to pass the Senate with a 60 vote threshold. They just have to pass with a 51 vote threshold, which they have. And we they have that capability because we lost the Georgia Senate. And we have to be able to get back into a system at least for the next little while of, of split government. And then if we can, if Republicans can take back the majority in 2022 in both the House and the Senate, and in 2024, have a Republican in the White House, there's a really, really unique opportunity to also us to use budget reconciliation and finish what we started with the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. And that's to go after some of these spending and entitlement reform measures. And that's that's somewhere that's that's a place I want to be. That's an that's an area that I want to be involved. That's why I'm pushing heavy for for ways and means, is because that's where everything will go through. All of mandatory spending basically goes through ways and means. That's why it's the number one most, how would you say, influential committee in Congress. And it is the issue that I think is our nation's biggest issue going forward. And, and I'll end with this. 2017, you saw the majority in the House, White House, and Senate. Their effort was to empower the American worker. I've got all the statistics here that my team did an excellent job that I've completely glossed over and not given you my speech that they fully prepared for me. But you can see middle class wage growth, real, wa real, real wage growth during that economic growth period from the Tax Cut and Jobs Act and the, and the, the years following. You also saw corporate taxes, corporate tax revenue increase. When you provide a competitive tax rate to American business and American workers, they'll grow the, they'll grow the whole entire pie. Why? Because they don't leave our shores. They don't set up shell companies to go to different tax havens that, 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 that enrich other nations. We keep that revenue here. I, I'm, I'm a big fan of creating revenue opportunities for the U.S. And in doing so, we keep that within our shores. And so you have a, a, a push. While we didn't fix all of the mandatory spending issues that we have in 2017, we did take an, a, an opportunity to truly empower the American worker. It's, it's, it's well highlighted in my, in my um, debt and deficit document. And in 2021, when this situation, I, I, I don't believe the Democrats were expecting to have the White House, House, and Senate. I think they thought they were going to still 
you know, have to be in a split government with the Senate under Republican control. But when that shifted, they went fast and furious on economic policy. And they, in doing so, they've empowered so much of government. And when you empower so much of government, you create inflation. <laughs> when you put that much monetary supply in, in the merchant, you suppress the workforce. When you create a job market where companies, private sector companies are competing with with the public sector, basically, or government spending, or you know, unemployment uninsur unemployment insurance, you create a market where you know you're not empowering the American worker; you're empowering government. And the outcomes from those two things are clear: economic growth versus inflation growth. And um, we need to make sure, as a party, as a conference, that we remain focused on how important it is for each and individual, every every American no matter what, if they're poor, middle class, wealthy, everybody benefits when you empower the American worker. And I'm and I've been trying and I'm trying to make that so central to my mission. When you look at my campaign advertisements, it's it's basically rooted in economic energy and foreign policy. Those directly affect each one of us. And that's where that's where I try to maintain my focus. So um, I know the topic's a little bit boring and maybe there's some more we're going to talk about in the QA, but I just this is a group that I know is extremely thoughtful. They're very aware and they're very engaged. I, I want to be known as somebody back there that is taking what Utah does so well and, and trying to implement that into our, our economic policy. We've got to be adults in the room and go after this debt and deficit issue. Um, the American people will, the faith will be restored, both in the American people and will show our nations abroad that we've got it figured out if we can go back and 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 reduce that debt to gdp ratio to a sustainable healthy level so thank you so much move this okay Congressman Moore, thank you so much for giving us those remarks. And as you mentioned, it's it's a tough issue that maybe isn't fun to talk about, but also that's the value of this congressional series and the Sutherland Institute is helping to bring that civic awareness to the public about issues that really matter and really affect their lives. So thank you for those thoughtful remarks. Thank you. And I know there's lots of folks that are you know streaming or whatever, to whatever extent you can, make sure you can provide that document, that debt deficit information, you can send that out to. Would love it. Appreciate it. So I, I want to start with a big picture question and then see if we can tie it back to some of the specific things you mentioned about debt and deficit and mandatory spending. So, so to put things into perspective, a recent Gallup poll that came out showed that confidence in Congress was at historic lows in the single digits, just as an institution. I would add my voice to that. <laughs> so, so, so you agree that, that, that it, is Congress, I guess, worthy of that? lack of confidence from the people as a body yes the issue though is that when you go and look at each individual congressman or woman from a given district they obviously are getting reelected and 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 have a a much stronger approval rating uh, we did a bunch of polling and i was in the positive category right and most folks are so it's it's this issue of well i like my member of congress but i don't like congress as a whole why do you think that is? Why is it, well, my guy is great, but the institution he is part of is deeply flawed. Why do you think there's that disconnect? Because more people in Utah's first district want uh, want somebody that cares a lot about the issues that I pull. Debt, debt deficit, inflation, um, and uh, – you know, there's there, there's a defense, there's a there's a strong defense, but it's even down low. The things that are top of mind to people are jobs in the economy, debt, deficit, and and so they want someone that's focused on that. And so they 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 for the most part, I'll just because I've just gone through a at least primary election and was successful and 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 optimistic of the next, but they they want more members of Congress doing what you know is concerning to them and and how they go about doing it. And that's not what they see. They they see dysfunction and and here's the area that I that I will add to this is 
they're sick and tired of there being so much dysfunction with the way we, with how we address our um, immigration, right? And it's, and it's, immigration is a three-pronged approach from good policy to border, to strengthening our border, to is to also welcoming an immigrant workforce with a, with a, you know, Logan's got like a 1.8% on unemployment across Utah. We're strong as ever on unemployment. There are numerous companies, manufacturing, agriculture, they need more workforce, but because Congress can't get its act together. And frankly, you know, the executive branch can't get its act together on how they address immigration. That frustration leads down here. And so they see like these big ticket items, debt, immigration, and they get so frustrated that we can't figure it out or find ways to to, to work together to solve some of our nation's biggest issues um, that they continually be more and more frustrated. So you get into the single digits of of approval rating. So, so thinking of that decline in trust, and you mentioned some other important issues in the context of those issues or what you talked about today with debt and deficit, I mean, elected officials talk about, not all, but many over the years have talked about reducing our excessive spending, bringing down the debt, eliminating the deficit. That's that's a talking point for years and years and years. But as you've mentioned, things still aren't moving in the right direction. To what extent do you think that specific issue is a contributor to the decline in trust of institutions? Well, they keep talking about this stuff, but no progress has happened. Yeah, and I'll even say, it sort of hinted towards it, it's probably my biggest risk to make this when I get a chance to talk to Sutherland Institute to make this my main topic and, and knowing that I'm one of 535 given the Senate as well. And the fact that it hasn't been fixed for over 20 years, at least till, you know, I, like, again, I would, I just, I want us to get close back to getting that, that, that balanced budget, even if there's something that takes us away from it for a time, but we can, if we can get back to that and keep our debt to GP ratio in a healthy level, you know, that's a win. I would, if we could get, we're to the point now, I would give anything for a balanced budget amendment and something that could actually work. But I'm not even claiming that. But that's my risk, is I'm making this my big topic. And in five to seven years, if our debt has only increased and we haven't solved our deficit issues, my goodness, I'll, I'll have been ineffectual back there. But guess what? I know that it's our biggest issue, so I don't really care. Like, if, 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 if I don't bend our debt to GDP trajectory, if I'm not back there during a time where we bend our debt to GDP trajectory back down to a healthier level, I'll be the first one to show up and say, "Hey, I've done some great things, and we've had, you know, we've we've done a lot of good work, particularly with Hill Air Force Base and 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 and, and some of the committee work that I've done in legislation." But ultimately, I I haven't been able to solve our biggest problem. I'll be the first one to come back and say that. So yeah, talking about it and not being able to fix it is going to be frustrating for anybody. Um, and hopefully, you know, hopefully we can come out of this COVID with a bit of a renewed jolt and say, what are we doing? Like, this is not the right direction and, and, and we can figure it out. Because honestly, because the last time we had a balanced budget, it was a Democrat in the White House and Republican controlled Congress, and they found a way to work together. President Clinton basically signed a work requirement into health, into welfare reform. That'd be unheard of today, right? Like it's just, and and we're coming more and more divided and more hyper partisan for, th- for th- we 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 should be divided on several issues, but immigration and debt and things like that shouldn't be the things, and infrastructure shouldn't be the things that divide us. The things that divide us are are other aspects. But so I, I want to get into the division and some of the big picture trends there. But to stay on this topic for a moment, you mentioned the trend in the way people and elected officials view the budget and debt and deficit. And you talked about 2016, how that there wasn't nearly enough discussion about that in, in that campaign cycle. And, and I'm curious what you view as the cause for that. Is it that people, just voters, have started to care a little bit less than they used to? Or is that people still care, but elected officials are going in a different direction? Is it the the rise of something called modern monetary theory. Thank you. I was just yeah. going to say this, not calling it that, because you'll never hear a Republican out there saying I'm fully into modern monetary theory. You may hear a handful of Democrats, but I don't even think the majority of them would ultimately say, no, no, we're good. Because I mean, President Biden is talking about reducing the deficit. So there is still that that interest, right? His approach to doing it, I don't agree with, but there's at least the the chatter we would need to reduce the deficit. President um, President Trump, they laid out, you know, 
had we kept the majority leading into maybe a second term for him, that's when a lot of folks wanted to go after it and do some of the, the deficit reduction and, 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 and see the value of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, bring in that, that economic growth, and then, and, then, and then figure out a way to tackle it. It's just not as popular, right? Republicans, it's always easy for us to, to lower taxes. It's harder for us to lower spending politically. Democrats are the exact opposite. It's easy to increase spending, but it's much harder for them to increase taxes. You saw they, they want they wanted to raise the corporate tax rate to twenty eight percent from twenty one to twenty eight. They wanted to to get rid of ten thirty one exchanges over five hundred grand. They wanted to get they wanted to double capital gains. That was their planned out initiative when they got the majorities eighteen months ago, and none of that came through. Now they're raising revenues by adding, you know, eighty billion dollars to the IRS, which is as, as someone who you know, values the work that our, the IRS in Ogden does. And I support IRS. Uh, I represent them. They don't need a billion dollars. <laughs> they need a big, strong investment in customer service, uh, new answering machine. Like, there's a lot of work that I do. My caseworker would probably nod profusely at that. Um, there's an investment in customer service where you don't have to invest in, 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 in that big of a workforce. Cause I don't like where that's going to go. Um, so not exactly hitting on, on, on your question per se, but this slow creep of, ah, geez, we've been okay, actually, for the last little while without a balanced budget. That's really hard to do that. I think we'll be, well, we'll be okay. We'll be okay. So this, no one would call it modern monetary theory, but it's, it creeps into people's minds. Like, ah, I guess we got to run another deficit. We got to, we got to continue on with this route. And it's, um, it's tough to, to sort of, to, to grapple with that. Um, and you don't, Unless you take a look back and actually look at the numbers and see the graphs and how rapid they just shot up with respect to debt to GDP, it's uh, it's very concerning that you know once we we've never had this type of debt with interest rates increasing, paying down that debt is going to be much more difficult, and so that that'll come as a shock in multiple ways to us. The one final question specifically on on the budget piece, and then I want to get into more some of the big picture issues around division and contempt and, and some of the things we've seen happening in our country. You talked a lot about mandatory mandatory spending versus discretionary spending. And as you mentioned, it might be a little bit wonky, but it's something that I think is very important for people to understand because that's what drives the internal dynamics of debt and deficit in Congress and for the country. So what I want to ask you about is mandatory spending. You gave that very startling statistic of kind of the 3070 flip since since 1971, I believe. Yeah. And do you see that as, and, and you alluded to this in your remarks, but more and more things getting added into the mandatory spending category or the things that are already there in mandatory spending just becoming more and more costly? How would you say that, that, that the trend of, well, let's just put as much as we can into mandatory spending is a major contributor to that being a, a primary growth function of the budget? It's something that we've seen recently with some of our legislation. And so that's why it's so alarming to me. I still think probably the biggest issue with mandatory spending is that it grows you know, rapidly, grows at a high clip, 10 to 12% uh, on an annual, right? And that, those numbers can fluctuate. But you also have an aging population, right? And so all these compounding factors, I still think are by far the, the biggest issue. And without making structural reform to that, um, that's where my that's where my my biggest issues. We 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 will be heavily voted. We're, we're fortunate to win the the majority this this fall, which I'm working my tail off to to help other candidates across the particularly the Western United States. I'm gonna get a little plan and put in place that I can you know lay, lean in and and help out while still running a strong campaign here. But winning the majority you won't see that type of work getting placed into mandatory. Um, so I'm not as concerned that that continues on as a trend. What I'm concerned about is what's already there, that it's just going to keep growing and growing and growing. And, and then the debt servicing will grow and grow and grow. Let me, let me add a, one quick thing. So, and we highlight this mandatory spending. One of the issues is social security. Well, Congress just passed the secure 2.0 act with broad, broad bipartisan support. Does anybody have heard of the secure 2.0? Exactly. Right. No one really sees the work, and maybe I'm preempting what you're talking about. No one sees that the vast majority of bills get passed on suspension votes, like 
they came out of committee with broad bipartisan support. Most of my bills, um, they earned near unanimous support from Natural Resources Committee. They weren't easy, and it takes a lot of work, but you know, they ultimately they get passed with broad bipartisan support. Um, our media networks want us to continually feel the anger and the division because that fuels clicks, that fuels viewership. No questions about it. Um, the, but the big issues we've got to be able to come together on, and I'll let you ask that question. But as I talk about Secure 2.0, what Secure 2.0 is, is a retirement plan, basically. It actually, it makes it easier for Americans to, to, to plan for their retirement early. So one really cool provision, and I sat down my interns in the DC office the other day, um, I will do you two as well. Uh, if you come out of college with student loan debt, which I'm fine you doing, you've planned for it, you've made an investment in yourself, you shouldn't just be handed money from taxpayers to get that wiped out. Whole nother, whole nother topic one day to talk about just forgiving student loan debt for willy-nilly no reason. doesn't even go to the right folks. Um, this allows for you to pay down your, your student debt, and if you're showing your company that you're doing that, your company can now contribute to your own 401k. Before you'd have to do a match. Like if I, oh, if I gave 5% of my income, then my company would do their 5% match. But if you're now contributing to your student loan getting paid down, your company can contribute to your 401k. That's going to start 401k investments five, six, seven years earlier. And you all know what five years when you're 20 in your 20s does to your retirement account when you're 60, 70. It'll be a huge benefit. And we all came together and worked on something like that. That's the stuff that comes out of Ways and Means Committee that you don't really hear about but it's got really good, it's a really good um, structural prognosis and a lot of different things like that. Because Social Security is going to be on a fiscal cliff. Medicare Part A is going to be on a fiscal cliff. Uh, the, the portions of Medicare, exactly what if it's all Part A, whatever. Um, those things need to be addressed, particularly Medicare in the next five years. Like we have an opportunity and, we, and sometimes unless you're forced to do it, unless it's an absolute must, like Congress doesn't usually get it done. But when, they're, when they absolutely have to get something done, they find a way to get it done. It's kind of like the debt ceiling, which I would completely get rid of and just make it a debt to GDP ratio markers, which we talked about. But um, anyway, so maybe that leads into the division question. No, that's perfect. And actually, it, it kind of can combine two questions in one because one, one thing I was going to ask you later was, what are the kinds of things you wish people would pay attention to that, that, they, that they don't or can't? But perhaps it's a function of, what gets all the attention in Washington in terms of news coverage, in terms of social media churn. So that, that environment that seems to be, as you said, sort of feeding this environment of division, it, it really feels, and I, I, I think we'd all agree that the division between parties, between different ideas is worse than it's ever been in, in a long, long time, perhaps in any of our lifetimes. And so can you articulate how you see that general feeling of division impacting Congress, impacting the ability to do things like have a better debt to, debt to GDP ratio, or impact the ability to even talk about the things where there is consensus, where we are making progress. Yeah. Um, I, I honestly think the majority of the division and why it feels like it's so bad, I, I agree with you. It is bad. My third day was January 6th, right? And um, like. It, it, it that exacerbated things and it's made it it made it more difficult for individuals to communicate plus we were always wearing masks and stuff and we didn't really know like it was it was a tough time to enter congress like i could write a book about it maybe i will one day um don't worry anybody we're good <laughs> not gonna write a book anytime soon the media i've gotten criticized for votes i took on the house floor that came out of committee via a voice vote because it was so sound and broadly supported that our ranking member, the head person on the Republican side of that certain committee, fully supported, I'm going to lean in and, you know, in the Republican Party, you hear a lot of media personality, you hear a lot of personalities out there. Well, I could list committee heads, and you won't even know who they are. Why? Because they're not out there trying to be celebrities all the time. They're trying to build solid policy. I asked a group of people the other day who Kevin Brady was. And they're like, I have no idea. And they're like, do you know who like Matt Gates is? And they're like, oh yeah, of course I do. 
Gavin Brady led the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, the most consequential piece of tax legislation in my lifetime, in any of our lifetime, in my opinion. Uh, President Adams, the other day, I was talking to him about it, and he says, I never thought I'd see it in my lifetime. To see that type of reform being done so we can be competitive on a global scale was enormously a good thing. And did it cause more debt? Yes. But did it enable us to be able to get right on the right footing to, 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 to be in the right direction long term? Absolutely. And I'll defend that till, till, till the day I'm blue in the face. Like that, that, that's something I firmly believe in. But you will never know who people don't know who Kevin Brady is. He's just retiring after 26 years. One of the most valiant, awesome people I know. And, uh, and that, that's what I would say to people is make, go, go figure out who the committee chairs are. The people running the policy, go figure out Patrick McHenry for financial services. Utah has the fifth largest assets under management. I've heard that term. I haven't done the analysis myself, but Utah's got one of the strongest financial services market in the nation for a small, relatively small state. And we hit above our weight primarily because of the work that Orrin Hatch did on the finance committee. And he did a really strong, he created a really good network here and was, was, was influential. The private sector creates the network, but, um, Patrick McHenry is the head of financial services, and is his role is far more important than anybody that's got you know millions and millions of Twitter followers. And so I've made a decision, and I'll walk into every member of my my party and the individuals making decisions on committee and be like, "Folks, look, I'm not here for Twitter. I'm literally here for the committee work. That's why they threw a third one on me." <laughs> uh, which, you know, my team was like, great, a third committee. Fabulous. Thanks for that. No, but they've loved it. We've loved it. And it's been, it's been good. And it's in the right direction. But know who the committee chairs are. Those are the individuals doing the really, really hard work. Kathy McMorris Rogers, we want to talk about what this reconciliation is gonna, bill is going to do with health care. Like, look into her team and know what, what's going on there. Like, that's the, that's the people that I wish were getting more attention. But that's, that, that's the world of politics. Um, and, you know, the reason they don't get it is because... You know, they're not actually looking for it either, but what they're doing is consequential. I think that's a good way to sort of frame the the questions about division and contempt. And many of us are familiar with the Harvard scholar, Arthur Brooks, who somewhat famously said that one of the key problems in our current political environment is this increase in contempt. It's not just that you disagree with somebody, you you feel contempt toward them which he defines as the unsullied conviction of the worthlessness of another. So I, I wonder if you could comment on that coupled with another trend that we've seen. A group of social scientists have, have looked at political affiliation as sort of this tribalistic instinct that we want to stick with our tribes, even as tribes, if they get more extreme, we'd rather stick with our perhaps more extreme tribe than give power to the opposition. Do, do you see those things happening at a high level in Congress, the contempt and the tribalism, and perhaps is what you talked about is focusing on where the real real work is getting done is the antidote to that. Yeah, I, I think you could get into a really large discussion about the way m- members of Congress are elected. Uh, if if the f- a fringe group, a fringe voice of individuals gets to, to have the majority of the control, I don't believe that's the way our founders intended for you know, equal representation. I don't think that's why they set up the House of Representatives the way they did. I I represent 800,000 people, but I'm elected by, um, uh, given where my general might be, I'm elected by a Republican primary, which I want a strong percentage of, which I'm thrilled about. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm grateful that I've been able to communicate strongly with this group, but you could get into a whole discussion on, on how we go about, you know, our election system. That's that's not as much of a, a concern to me right now as in you know you know how much contempt the media wants us to feel towards the other person. So, in a, let me take it to a micro level just briefly because that's what I can control. As I'm looking out here, you can see um, we've got an issue with the Great Salt Lake. It was a really great rainstorm this past weekend. I'm all for it. Ruined my plans. But I'm at the point now where I don't even bu- get bugged about that. I'm just like, great, keep raining, please. I don't care if my plans at Bear Lake were ruined. Um, we got a problem with the Great Salt Lake. In order to get a substantive bill done, I had to identify a member. And when I'm in the minority, it's even more important. I had to identify a member of the majority in my committee. And uh, we had to go work with them. And I'll give the vast majority of credit to my team, particularly my ledge team, um, 
to, to, to identifying who that would be, who'd be a good person. Well, there's an individual in California named Jared Huffman. Go ahead and take a look at his Twitter profile. He's a very liberal, very progressive member of Congress, um, very outspoken. I mean, I disagree on a lot, particularly energy policy. I've created a, a, a friendship with him. And why did I do that? Because I grew up watching Senator Orrin Hatch do so much good for Utah, so much good with the concept of civility, but willing to disagree and stand up for your principles in mind. That, to me, is a microcosm of how, how you know I went to the giant in the city and to see the relationship that he had built with Ted Kennedy was, was tumultuous. They argued a lot, but they had a general respect for each other. And ultimately, they were each able to represent their constituents. And 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 in Senator, the late Senator Orrin Hatch represented his constituents tremendously, and I think that was core to his entire function for being back there. As I've learned and dug into more of his of his time, and as I've learned, met, met more of his family and know more about him, like he he wanted that civility, but that productivity as well. And so uh, this individual, Rep Huffman, has a dry lake or a saline lake, a, a terminal lake, if you will, in his district. It's a part of a Great Basin network of, of several lakes, and we put together the, a bill, the Saline Lakes Ecosystems Act, that's going to put a USGS, U.S. Geological Survey, uh, putting together some data for our state legislators and our governor to use on coming up with some good mitigation efforts. Uh, that's the role we could play at the federal government. The work that's being done locally is by far the most important, and I've loved seeing them, them come together and, and find real options and real solutions, and, and they're doing that. Uh, amidst criticism constantly of not f solving it fast enough, but they're working towards the right goal. And we were able to lean in and do something. But I, I have to develop relationships with those indiv with, with individuals that I disagree with, because there are going to be opportunities like this where we can come together. And um, I look about look at that, and that's one of that's one of the neatest things that I was able to accomplish in my first term was to 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 to, to get above the politics of it, and. Um, I, I, I get asked, you know, what's your big surprise? And I have several, but one of them is how much of the work that gets done back there is based on personal, interpersonal relationships. And that was a direct response. I walked up to him. I said, look, August's work period, the district work period is coming up. We're not going to get many things more on the floor. This bill has been sitting in our, in your guys's queue. Jared, can you do anything? And two days later, he called me and said, I've got it in the bill. We're going to get it passed. Um, I ultimately voted against the larger package, but that provision got passed and the bill got passed. And, um, and that was all just because of a personal relationship. And so just, there's plenty of that going on. There's plenty of the opposite going on. Uh, but that's who I'm, that's what I'm going to be committed to because the people that elected me, I think expect that from me and whether they want me to be a firebrand and constantly like railing on, on social media or, or, um, Fox, uh, cable news your version of cable news. What I want to do is build strong credibility within my committee to then have that really credible voice to come out and, 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 and speak to it. That's my approach. And that's, that's the way that I hope to, to, to create much better impact back there. Well, that's a perfect note to end on. We just have, have a minute or two left, but I want to kind of hone in on that, that optimism that you offered. That, and first, I want to mention if, if there's anything else that you didn't get to that you wanted to ch chime in on that as well. But as, as you kind of give your closing answer to this question, as we wrap up, for the viewers out there, for the folks in the room, for just the regular voters, the regular citizens, it's one thing to talk about, well, well, when we're back in Washington, we need to make those relationships across the aisle to work together to get stuff out of committee. But for the people, what advice can you offer and also to give some optimism and hope that these divisions can be healed on a personal level in our own community so that that can be better reflected in Washington. I just want, and I hope that, and I, and, and the type of, the type of team we have and the, the type of approach that I'm trying to take back there. And again, I didn't expect to, to mention Senator Hatch as much as I did. I it's just with him passing and everything I did. I really valued his ability to get things done remain his remain true to his conservative principles but be productive is something that i want to take an approach to now if that means that i'm a dying breed of a type of politician because i don't have a large enough like like 
presence and in 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 that that world and then maybe I'm not long for this role but while I'm but but I but I don't believe that's true I don't believe that's what Utah conservatives or just Utah in general want from their elected leaders and you've got a really really good delegation that's that's focused on that as well and I've loved the interaction I've had with all the teams of from Utah back there but I would just encourage individuals voters constituents to, to look a layer deeper and be like, okay, well, what is Representative Moore doing to oppose this reconciliation bill? Well, I'm clearly going to vote against it, but I like to be able to highlight why it's, why it is even a, an option. We can't lose elections. So what is my representative doing to make sure that he is working towards, in this case, something I think is very important especially with the the trend of spending we've seen over the last 18 months to to put a stop to that by winning the majority. And so that's where Blake is really focused on is is you know getting the structure set up. Not just railing about it and going on and on. I will put out you know information on every bill, I'll put a statement out on everything that we need to um but but judge me on on what I'm doing and if you're frustrated with the debt in Washington, judge me on what my thoughts are, the efforts that I'm trying to do. Look a layer deeper than just what is what you 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 perceive within the media, um, because sort of our fringe media is on the right and the left. They don't have the best interest in mind to make Congress have better outcomes. They want that division and, and everything, and, and I'm not just not going to pander to it. I'm going to show up and I'm going to vote a certain way that I know is sound. And I'm going to come and explain that vote as opposed to just saying, ah, this might be a little bit difficult for me to explain. And it's easier for me to just vote this way because, but no, I think it's better for even my very conservative district. This is how I'm going to vote. And this is why, and I will show up and explain it every single time. Thank you, representative. As we wrap up, I'll turn things over to Rick. Just a quick thank you. I won't leave you guys sitting there, but our sincere thanks to uh, Congressman Moore and to his team. We realize it's a lot of work to get uh, to get these things organized. Thanks again to Zions Bank and to each of you for joining us today. We're at the midpoint of our congressional series. Um, our next uh, three events, Monday, August 15th at 10 a.m., we'll hear from Senator Lee, and then we'll wrap up on Thursday, August 18th with a double header. We'll have Representative Owens in the morning at 10 a.m. and Senator Romney at uh, at two in the afternoon. And I remind you, you'll see clips and deeper analysis of these conversations um, at SutherlandInstitute.org. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.